Hi there. So today we have ourselves here an A1706 MacBook Pro Touch Bar. And this one's in for a very interesting issue that is uh, common, yet only really happens whenever someone is opening up the MacBook itself. So in this instance, there is probably two underlying issues. Uh, however, there's one major one that was created because someone took it upon themselves to remove their bottom case. Now, I don't discourage anyone from doing uh, any repairs on your own MacBook, but one thing that Apple did on this specific MacBook that makes things just a little bit more tricky than in previous MacBooks is there are missing side screws which have been replaced with internal clips instead so what you would do on a previous macbook like a, a retina model or a unibody model is you'd have 10 screws uh, four here in the bottom two on the sides and four more at the top what apple tried to do i can't really explain why they did it um i guess to cut down on screws or to make this just a little bit more difficult for opening is they removed the side screws and the center top screws and instead replace them with hooks. So what tends to happen is, or uh, how you would open up this MacBook is first you would remove all of your bottom screws. After that, you're gonna get like a suction cup tool, or at least that's what I prefer using. And you're gonna use like a pick. And what you do with a suction cup is you pull up on the bottom case while you can wedge a pick into the bottom case and you slide it until you hear a pop. That's going to be the clip that is uh, holding the bottom case to the top case of the unit itself. However, if you don't know that information up front, what tends to happen is you will probably think that it's stuck and try to pull up on the case a little harder than you should. And when that happens, the most common thing that will occur will be you'll slide the bottom case across the logic board and rip a couple of components off of the board at the same time. So if we look at this bottom case right here, you can actually see that there are a couple of hooks, uh, literally a couple, one on each side. And this is what's replacing the two screws that used to exist here on the retina and the unibody. Well, these little plastic hooks are what's grabbing various components on the board uh, and just kind of tearing things off with it as it goes. So what happened here is the computer itself was opened up. I'm not sure if it was by a client or if it was by another repair shop. This one was sent to us by another repair shop. So we're kind of in the dark on exactly what happened here. But one thing I can confirm is when we look underneath our microscope here, you can see right here on the left side of the board, there is some damage, a lot of damage actually. And what makes this repair so tricky is there are missing traces with it as well. Uh, you can actually see uh, the traces, pretty much every single trace that was underneath this uh, IC here has been completely ripped up. So I have done this repair before using a technique I've actually seen Paul from Rossman Group use where essentially instead of trying to repair the individual pads and laying the chip back on top, instead we're going to flip the chip upside down and run the wires from the board itself over onto the chip. Now, um, this does get a little tricky when we talk about this specific trace in particular. And I'll show you exactly why. If we bring over our FlexBoard View software, I've already zoomed in on the part right here. It is U5860. And now if we search for U5860 in the schematic, I've actually looked it up a couple of times, um, we can actually see the, that it is responsible for Thunderbolt and Airflow Write. And when we look a little bit further into it, we can see it's a Thunderbolt THRM, thermal. This is going to be a thermal sensor. And if we actually look here in the bottom of the, the schematic, it says thermal sensor. So what makes this uh, specific repair a little bit tricky is if we look right here on, let's say, pin one. All right, so pin one, we can just solder a trace 
directly from pin one to this resistor. Uh, pin two, we can go to this capacitor. Pin three, we can go to this other end of the capacitor, but pin four, there is nothing nearby we can solder onto. However, if we look on the other side of the board, we can see that pin four eventually attaches to R5861 on pin two of the resistor. It is literally on the other side of the board. So we can do one or two things. We can either scrape away the top layer of the board to see that tiny, tiny, tiny little copper piece right there. And we're going to try to solder a jumper wire to it. And if we are unsuccessful, then what we'll have to end up doing is pulling the board out and soldering a wire from underneath the board and wrapping it around to come here to pin four. Now, why is this so important? Now, obviously, you don't want to have any components just floating around on your logic board. But what tends to happen here is that the computer itself it goes into a fail-safe mode. It's a thermal sensor, and if a thermal sensor is not properly communicating, what happens is the computer thinks it's on fire. And when the computer thinks that it's on fire, what it ends up doing is having the fan run at full speed, and also makes the processor uh, underclock itself. It throttles itself, and the computer itself runs really slow. So you can already see the fans are already spinning. Now this MacBook is smart, and it's not supposed to have the fan spin unless it gets hot, unless the thermal sensors are messed up. So here in a second, we're actually gonna start hearing the fans start to get a little louder, and it's increasingly louder. And by now, this should have already got to the login screen, but instead it's taking its time. And that goes back to what I was mentioning with the processor itself is throttling. Now if we listen, we can hear that the fans are just starting to get louder and louder and this is gonna keep happening, increasing until it maxes out at its max RPM. And this is still running slow and it hasn't even gone to the login screen. Now what makes me so reluctant about this repair is that someone opened this up for a reason. Why was that? I don't know at this moment just yet. One thing I do know is that I am going to have to replace um, this IC. There's a chip on the, or there's a chip in the chip. There's a, a piece of the IC that looks like it's been ripped off uh, uh, in the corner. So I'm actually going to replace the thermal sensor itself. And... Um, after that, I'm going to have to troubleshoot a little bit further onto why was this even opened up in the first place. Because unless someone really just wanted to see what the bottom case or the logic board looked like inside of this computer, someone else would mess with this. However, now as I'm talking, if I look a little bit closer, there is a number two right here. Now this doesn't come with the Sharpie written on it from the factory. So it's possible that this was sent to another shop or the client themselves uh, took this upon themselves for a screen replacement. That number two is actually on the TCON board of the display. So it is very possible that someone opened this up to do a screen repair and in the process they ripped off this part of the logic board. So that kind of gives me a little bit more solace knowing that if we were replace this thermal sensor and um, do a quality control test, there might not be any other issues. It's very possible the main issue was just a screen repair. I'm sorry, <laughs> trying a whole different setup here. So um, I thought I was talking to the camera, but instead I was just talking to nothingness there. So, or at least the camera wasn't looking at me. Anyways, I'm rambling at this point. It's time for us to go ahead and start working on the actual board repair. So like any board repair, the most important thing we're going to do first is unplug our battery. So let's go ahead and start off with that. So 
So we're going to remove our battery management cable and then remove the screw that is actually connecting the battery to the logic board. Now for this specific repair, we actually shouldn't have to remove the, the logic board from the top case. So let's examine what we got going on here. Because what we want to do is remove this chip and we're going to be replacing it with one from a donor computer. And I actually hard, didn't even have to touch this. This just came right up. So, now what we want to do is go ahead and start etching away into our traces and expose them a little bit more. So there's a little bit of conformal coating on top of all of our wire, or on all of our traces. We're going to remove that and expose our copper. And this is going to be where we're going to solder our jumper wires. Right here, this is a via for our pin nine. So I'm exposing the via itself because later on we are going to solder directly to this. Now this via up here, looking at the schematic in the corner of my eye, this is going to be for pin eight. And this part of the trace is loose, so I'm actually just going to kind of fatigue this back and forth like a paper clip until it breaks off. Now let's move on to what I can assume is pin 7. Now, on this pin, pin 6, pin 6 is actually going to be ground. So we can actually just steal ground from a nearby component. You can see right here, pin 6, it's ground. So in theory, we could actually just solder a wire from ground, let's say, from like this capacitor, and that would work. So let's go back down here onto pin 1. Pin 3 is basically completely ripped off all the way to the capacitor, so I'm just going to remove that trace entirely. And, you know, let's make things easier. What I'm actually going to do is solder wires directly from the components down here to our replacement chip. 
However, the most important one is going to be this wire that is hiding in the fiberglass, and that is pin 4. Now, pin 4, the only other side or uh, only other nearby connection is going to be on the other side of the board connected to a resistor. So I want to try to expose as much as possible of this wire so I can just go ahead and solder, well not a wire, it's a trace, but go ahead and solder a trace, a wire to the trace. I, uh, I apologize, it is 1146. Let's clean up all the scraped, all of the, there we go, all the scraped. Okay. Uh, what I was trying to say, sorry, I was looking at something in the corner of my, uh, we were just going to go ahead and clean up all the scraped fiberglass. And now, what we're going to do is kind of move this capacitor that's down here, and then we're going to tin up our wires, or our traces. So for that, we're going to need a little bit of flux. I accidentally got a little bit too much flux. Way too much flux. Depends on who you are, that is a matter of opinion. For me, this is too much flux. More than I like to work with. You're not going to hurt anything by having too much flux. Just it's gonna make a mess is all. And so I want to try to alleviate as much of a mess as possible. So now let's go ahead and try to resolve this capacitor that looks to be lifted up a little too much. Let's wait for the beep. Alrighty. Now let's switch out to our micro pencil. And we're going to use our micro pencil just to touch up our traces that we have here.
And now I'm just trying to touch up our pin 4, which has that trace that's going to the via th that's trying to go to the other side of the, the board. And I think I got it. Let's clean up our leftover flux for now. And let's take a look at that pin 4 again to make sure that is solid. Looks like that's as good as it's going to get for now. And out of curiosity, I just want to make sure I didn't go into t the layer below the top layer. Make sure it's not grounded. Beautiful. And then this capacitor is good. Let's make sure the other side is good. Fantastic. Okay, so here comes the very interesting part that the technique that I learned from watching Paul from Rossman Group. This uh, guide, or not guide, but this um, this way w was actually shown to me by one of the viewers of this channel. He sent me a link directly to the video and it really helped me out with a live stream I did about a year ago. And so I thought this was a very, very fascinating technique. So now we're actually gonna have to get a new IC. Normally I would try to reuse the one that's on the board, but there's something suspicious about this corner on this chip. Well, there's flux on it now, but right here, this corner looks like that a chunk of it has been taken out. Which I wouldn't be surprised, just because that chunk would have probably occurred when someone had taken the bottom case off. However, I brought some donor boards with me, so we should be able to take care of this no problem. So for this one, we're actually going to need to use some heat. I have some new equipment since my last stream. This is actually my second soldering station. And what I have now is the Atin, or Atin. I'm not sure, I've never actually heard anyone pronounce it. But it is the other rework station that Rossman Group sells. I use the Quick at my main office. And now I have this one here. And what's fascinating about this one is that there's a button on it to turn it on and off. I've never had that before. I'm just so used to kind of lifting up and it just automatically starts turning on. But right here, we press this button and now it is turning on the the rework station. I kind of like it. Let's go ahead and start removing this one. Beautiful. Now to make sure that this replacement IC goes on without a hitch, I'm going to clean it up of the flux residue that I just put on it. And for that, we just simply use a Q-tip with some 99% isopropyl alcohol. And we are ready to start soldering our replacement IC. 
jumper wires. Well, just about, actually. I take that back. There's one more step we need to do that is very controversial, but it works. Need to clean up that part of the board. And pardon me for a moment while I grab one extra tool. We are going to be super gluing the chip. Now, I know that sounds very, very, very controversial, but what we'll have to end up doing is super gluing. We're gonna be flipping this chip upside down and we're gonna put it right here in this spot. So what we need to do is super glue this chip upside down. So it's gonna lay like this. And the super glue essentially is just gonna hold it in place so that we can solder the rest of the wires to it. Pardon me for a moment. Okay, and I'm back. All right, so let's go ahead and start with the super gluing process. First, we want to make sure that we have this chip in the right orientation. And so when we reference our schematic, we can see that pin one is going to be facing the orientation of bottom left. Now, pin one is going to be this dot right here. So what I want to do is just completely flip this over vertically so that pin one is facing right here instead. Good. Now let's go ahead and get a dab of glue. I'm just going to put a little bit on my scalpel here. And we're going to put a dab of it right here. And that should be more than enough to hold our chip in place. And I'm actually going to move it up a little bit. And I'm going to let that cure for a second. Meanwhile, let me just go ahead and kind of get in the excess residue. And it looks like it's actually already hardened up here on top of this chip. And all right down here. It looks like we are ready to go. Superglue typically doesn't have a lot of applications in our line of work. However, a tiny little dab in the right places will get you, uh, will get the, the strangest repairs done. Um, don't use Loctite on an iMac or on an iPad for sealing up the display. Um, there are other adhesives that are better quality rather than super glue. However, super glue does have a purpose in our industry. Um, it's just in very specific repairs. <laughs> this is one of those repairs. Now what we have to do is start soldering some jumper wire. 
and we need to determine what's going to be the easiest. Starting out from the furthest and working our way inward. We're starting from the inside and working our way outward. I think I'm going to start from the inside. So pin 4 is going to be our most complicated one here. So I'm going to go ahead and solder a wire from pin 4 and run it to right here on the IC itself. So for that, I'm going to need to put the right amount of flux on here. Because I just need it specifically for one jumper wire. And I'm going to need some jumper wire that has enamel coating on it. Uh, one second while I adjust my microscope, I realize it's a little blurry on one side than the other. I'm doing a video right now instead of a live stream. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And we'll pause for a quick intermission from Pepper. <laughs> Pepper the wiener dog. <laughs> Hello, baby. How's you going? <laughs> Sorry, I've got my gloves on. Why are you being so cute? Why are you being so cute? She's only 13 weeks old. And she's probably exhausted. Okay. Time to go to bed, Pepper. <laughs> she's cute. <laughs> So let's go ahead and get our jumper wire out. Okay. It just took me a little longer to get a piece of wire out, but I got it. And let's switch to our micro pencil for this job. It's thinking about connecting. Looks like we got it. Now I just need to run this wire up the side of the IC here.
And let's add just a little bit more flux on top of the IC right there on our pad four. A little bit right there. There we are. Let's take a closer look at our pin four. This is the part that's probably going to bite me. Uh, I want this to be a little bit more perfect. The problem is it's in such a tight crevasse that I might not be able to make it look perfect. Looks like that's going to work. Okay. Now let's cut the remainder of our wire. Pin four is probably going to be the most typical wire here. Beautiful. And we have eight more to go. The rest are going to be a little bit more streamlined from here. Let's put a dab of flux on this part of this capacitor and on pin three. Get a fresh wire. Okay, now that I'm holding that down in place, let me just tap pin three. And let's touch up this end of the capacitor. Beautiful. All right, like before, 
we're going to cut the remainder wire. Now this is where things get a little interesting because now I'm going to have to cut a wire or run a wire on the from the other side of this capacitor here to pin 2. Now this is enamel coated jumper wire so it does have a thin layer of enamel. This is going to work in my favor to where I can run some wire over each other and it's not going to be conductive. Let's touch up pin two. And I'm just going to put a little bit of flux on this just to touch it up. Beautiful. And just like with the other ones, I'm going to go ahead and cut the remaining wire. Alright, so before I go any further, I want to make sure that pin 2 and pin 3 do not have continuity between each other because it is a capacitor. So let's put our multimeter in continuity mode and touch both 2 and 3. Beautiful. There's no beep. Despite the fact that the wire is laying on top of each other, the enamel coating it's doing its job and is preventing the wires from actually being conductive. All right, let's move on to, oh wait, let's see. Yeah, that was four, three, two. Now we're gonna solder pin one. Now we're going to run this wire all the way to this part. I'm trying to do this with as minimal contact as possible. Okay, so I have this bent in the shape that I want it, and now let's just touch it up with our iron.
And same thing as before. Now what I want to do is make sure my multimeter doesn't beep like that whenever I touch any of the pins. So let's check and see if we have any continuity between pin one and pin two. Beautiful. What about pin one and pin three? We're good there. Pin one and pin four? Good there. Pin four doesn't look like it's actually touching anything um, other than the trace itself and pin four. Pin two and three look fine. So we are solid down here. Now I just need to move on through pin five through nine. Before I go any further, I'm just gonna clean up this part of the board with some ice purple alcohol and a Q-tip. And I'm just patting, trying my hardest not to really move these wires around. So for starters, what we want to do here is we're going to start with pin 9 and work our way outwards, just like what I did here before. Now pin 8, and, well this is pin 8, no that one's pin 9, that's right, that's pin 9, nope, my apologies, hold on, because we have everything flipped. So now that we have everything flipped, that's actually pin 6 and pin 5. So this is pin 6 and 5, and so pin 6 and 5 are ground. Instead of trying to solder directly to these wires like we did on our our uh, pad 4 or pin 4, is I'm just going to run a ground wire directly from, let's see, where can we run it from? There is this capacitor down here, and there's this one up here. Hmm. It's been a minute since I've done this, so let me see, what are we going to run it from? Let's try running it from the top. I just had to reference a photo of one that I did in the past. I'm going to run it from that capacitor. And let's go ahead and turn on our micro pencil. have a little bit of solder, a little extra solder that's kind of hanging out over here. And let's get our jumper wire ready. in a very tight spot here. And we got it. And we want this wire to be as thin as possible, or as short, as taut, as taut as possible. That's the word I'm looking for. And 
Now that I have pin six shaped the way that I want it to, or jumper wire six, let's just touch it up right here. And so it looks a little funny, a little oxidized, just because I need just a little bit more flux right here. And so pin five, which was this middle pad right here, was also part of pin, or part of ground. So we are also going to just touch that together right there. Beautiful. Now let's move on to soldering something. On to looking at our schematic, this is going to be pin seven. And it looks like we may need to add a little bit more flux to that. Looks a little on the dry side, but it's enough to hold it down in place. So let me see if I can bend my wire the way that I want it to go. Nope, not enough. All right, that seems to have taken a hold. Now let's swing this wire on over. And it looks like it came loose. So while I'm holding it down with my tweezers, let me see if I can kind of put that back into place. Mm, the wire itself is wanting to unwound itself. Okay, pin 7 might actually be the most difficult one here. Mm -hmm. There's not really much to connect to on that via. So I'm going to go with this one a little bit backwards. I'm actually going to solder a wire to the pin or the pad on the chip itself first. That way I have some tension. Now that that's in place, let's go ahead and form the wire how we want it to. And 
now that I'm holding this part down, let's see if I can just simply poke it with my iron. Looks like it's taking. And now we want to run our solder to our solder pin or soldering pad at the same time. Okay. So that made the VIA have a little bit better connection. There we are. Beautiful. Now I did use a little bit more temperature up here and because I did, I'm going to go ahead and clean up my flux here. The problem with flux is if you heat it up too much, it starts to turn into like a very thick, viscous, almost waxy substance. And it makes it a lot more difficult to melt with, to work with, and to clean with. Two more left to go. And before we continue any further, let's check and see if we have any continuity between our pin 7 and pin 6. Now that's going to be ground. Alright, so we have an issue here. Although it's not quite a full short, it's an impedance of 4. Let me see if I can lift this wire up a little bit. Okay, it's no way touching our pin six. Yep, okay. So what happened here is that I've actually burned a little bit of our enamel away, which is why it was making that noise because pin seven and six were actually being conductive. So what I did is I took my scalpel and just lifted up the connection right here, our wire. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm actually, before I move on to our next pin, I'm gonna apply a tiny, tiny little bit of mask. We're gonna end up doing uh, masking the entire board, or at least our pads or traces. But for right now, instead of running another wire, I'm just gonna put the tiniest amount of coating mask between these two wires. That way, they don't bridge. Now, whenever we're using mask, you want to use some sort of uh, safety goggles, since we are going to be using an infrared laser. Or not an infrared, we're going to be using a UV laser. So these are just uh, standard UV blocking glasses. You can get them online. Uh, I got these from Amazon, I think for about $12, but they block out blue light and UV light. So this UV pin that I use, I won't be able to um, have harmful UV go into my, my eyes as easily as if I didn't have it on. Another thing too is you don't want to look in your microscope whenever you're using the UV light only because the light itself is magnifying through the microscope. So I'm actually just looking at my OBS monitor here and referencing the location of the laser. Beautiful. So we basically had just replenished the missing enamel. Now let's see if six and seven are still touching. They are not. Now we can move on to eight. Pin eight. 
pin 8, pad 8, trace 8. Like before, let's put a little bit of flux right there on the IC itself. And let's put some flux right over our trace and our via. So now we need our jumper wire, like before. Gonna just touch our jumper wire directly to this trace. All right, that one went on pretty smoothly, so now let's bring this around. That one went on a lot smoother. Awesome. Now that we've trimmed down our e extra wire, let's go ahead and do the same thing. Let's check and see if pin 8 is touching pin 6, which is ground. It is not. Now let's see if it is touching pin 7. Uh, it would actually help if my multimeter was turned on. Hold on. Let's put this back into continuity mode. Make sure it beeps. Alright, pin 8, pin 6. We're good here. Pin 8, pin 7. We are good here. Alright. Final one, pin nine. I still have a little bit of flux over here, so let's go ahead and just kind of run a bead of solder. And now we have that via all nice and tinned up for another wire. That one took actually pretty quickly.
And just like all the other ones, let's go ahead and get this in a home. And I'm just going to go ahead and touch this up with a little bit more flux and solder. This is the part that always fights me, is when I'm trying to be a little bit more of a perfectionist. See, what did I tell you? I'm trying to be a perfectionist and it's actually fighting me. All right. So, what exactly happened here? I went ahead and tried putting a little bit more solder onto my via here and in the process, I actually moved my entire wire. Fortunately, I had enough slack that it shouldn't really have affected too much. Yeah, I'm not sure if you can hear about that, but that is a train passing by at one o'clock in the morning. Okay, let's see if we may have any connectivity. And pin 10 is not connected. It's an NC, so we actually don't need to worry about running a wire to it. Okay, so let's check and see. No conductivity between pin 9 and 8. Let's make sure this is actually working. Okay, let's try that again. Beautiful. Now pin 8, pin 7, pin 6. Good there. Pin 6 to anything. Okay, so it looks like right here, it, it looks like pin six. And which pin was this? This was pin three. Are both reading something. Let's change over to our camera here and see what we're looking at. So pin three is going to be Thunderbolt Thermal Sensor D1N. Okay, so th that that's fine. I've actually looked into this line before. The N, I think, stands for negative, because uh, right next to it, T, um, uh, pin 2, uh, RIO Thunderbolt Thermal Sensor D1P, positive. This all goes eventually to the Thunderbolt port right here, or Thunderbolt IC itself. So, not the Texas Instruments IC, the CD3215. Uh, it's a whole entire chip that's responsible for Thunderbolt. 
But this is actually um, supposed to be ground from my understanding. So that's, that's actually okay. We're going to leave that alone. So let's go ahead and clean this up some more. And before I put any coating on here, I am going to turn it on and see if our fans immediately turn on. Still make sure we don't have any... Yep, that's what I was afraid of. I noticed that this pin in particular, or this jumper wire, looked like it had been uh, heated up a little bit too much. And see, I barely moved it, and it's no longer being conductive to pad... What is this, 9? So that'd be pad 8. So before I do any of the thermal coating or mask, sorry, not the thermal coating, the, um, wow, I really can't think right now. Uh, before I do any of the mask, I'm going to go ahead and see if this one actually turns on and turns on properly. So let's switch over here to our overhead camera and turn off this light to bring our white balance back up. I'm gonna make sure I don't have any loose wire hanging out here. Looks good, and let's grab our battery screw and put this one back in. Okay. Let me turn off my fan, my fume extractor here, and let's see what's gonna happen. If everything went according to plan, we won't have an immediate fan spin. All right, we got 20 volts at 1.2 amps. So far, no fan spin. 20 volts at 1.6 amps, which means we should be turning on. I am getting a vibration on the trackpad. I heard a chime. And now we have our backlight. I'm just going to cover this up just in case it's got customer data. Still no fan spin, which means that the th thermal sensors are reporting as properly. And let's see if this actually gets to the home screen. You can see just like this, this actually booted significantly faster than it was trying to before. Um, and that's just because the processor is no longer underclocking itself. It is performing the way that it should. And just so we can kind of bring this in a little bit closer, you can see the fans are not spinning. And that's because this specific computer is smart in the sense the fans the fans kind of remind me of graphics processor fans. They only turn on whenever the device gets to a certain temperature. So there's really no need for them to immediately turn on like in older Retina models pre-2015 or um, maybe even 2013. No, it's 2015. And then unibodies where the fans just immediately turn on. Um, I just went ahead and disconnected her battery because that was a successful board repair. Um, now this method, I was a little hesitant when I first did it, uh, but thankfully uh, the username on YouTube, his name is Yummy Steak. He pointed me in the direction of doing this repair by referencing Paul's work from Rossman Group. So this is something that I really love about the repair industry, or re community really, is the fact that people are willing to share information to help other people succeed. Because in the end, it brings life back to consumer electronics, keeps these things out of landfills um, from becoming e-waste, and ultimately it's just more economical for customers in the long run. Um, I truly believe you should be able to get 
several years out of your computer. I always tell my clients typically 10 years out of a MacBook. And this one here is either 2016, 2017. So it'd be amazing if this computer can make it to 2026, no problem. Um, but where I was going off with this is this is a method I wouldn't have came up with. But someone else had shared this information that someone else had already done a video explaining people how to, uh, to, uh, to do. And uh, for that, I, I find that to be really, really awesome. So thank you for... I should say thank you, Yummy Steak, for pointing me in the direction of uh, Paul's video from Rossman Group. And Paul, thank you for showing us how to do this repair. Um, I'm just really, really grateful of the information that's out there. So let's go ahead and now continue putting our mask on the rest of this board. So the mask is just this liquid that cures with UV and turns into like a resin. So now I got a big blob of mask everywhere. I'm gonna start spreading it out without touching my wires. Just kind of pulling it with the surface tension. And so now we get ourselves a nice green mess. And before I close it up, I just want to make sure nothing is touching. And we have our pin 9 and 8 are touching again. So I'm going to lift up pin 9 right there. Because it looks like that's where it was touching. Or our jumper wire. Okay, no longer touching. So now it's time to just start, he um, not heating this stuff up, but curing it with our UV mask. Okay, and just because I touched it one more time, let's check eight and nine. Beautiful.
And so I put on a pretty thick layer here, so I'm gonna have to to light this up a couple of times. And I wanna hit different angles. Especially right here, because this is where my glob is a little bit thicker of ma mask. Okay, and that stuff looks pretty solid on this side. Let's make sure that pin 8 and pin 9 are still not touching each other. Excellent, and now I am going to run just a little bit more. And what I like to do is put a little bit of the mask on top of my scalpel here and kind of draw with it. All right, now let's hit it with a little bit more UV light. just need to get the mask from all angles here. Let's poke that with our scalpel and see if it's mushy or if it's hardened up. Looks like it's hardened up. Beautiful. And let's just test it out one last time for safe measure. Now that I have probed it, moved some wires around, we got the mask on there.
20 volts at 1.2 amps, 1.5 amps, 1.6 amps. Trackpad is clicking. Still no fan spin, and I just heard the noise of the battery from the charger being plugged in. 2.3 amps, still no fan spin. We have an Apple logo. It is booting up, and any second now, we should see that it's at the login screen. Awesome. Let's go ahead and shut that down. So, not tonight, but tomorrow morning, I'm going to do a quality control test on this just to make sure there's no extra issues with this one since it does look like that someone had opened this one causing this damage in the first place as well as um, it looks like the screen's been replaced here. So, that was a successful repair. I hope this helps someone else out in the future um, like Paul's video helped me. And um, thank you all for joining me. I'm um, sorry I didn't do a live stream. As you can see, I kind of have a different setup. This is my home office. We've just been so busy. I haven't really had uh, as much time to get things done at the store. So I've decided to just go ahead and replicate my exact same setup at the store at uh, my home office instead. Uh, this allows me to do more board repairs in my own leisure uh, after hours without having to be stuck at uh, the store all the time. I can actually come home to my dogs and my wife and um, I'd like to start doing a little bit more live streams from here as well as from uh, my main store as well. Um, the uninterruptions really helps me focus here. So thank you so much though for joining me and I look forward to see you guys in the next one. Have a great one.